Good morning, Richfield Church of Christ and any guests who are joining us online today. I want to say thank you for coming and uh, thank you for joining me as we enter into God's word together as we spend time in prayer and in taking communion. I'm going to begin today by just letting you know a couple things. Uh, one is that uh, this coming week on Saturday, July the 16th, I'm going to be flying out. Uh, I'll be flying to Boston and then going north of Boston to uh, Hamilton, Massachusetts, to where Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary is. Uh, this will be my final Doctor of Ministry residency uh, there on the campus, and I'll be there for two weeks. So I'll be coming back on June, excuse me, July the 30th. Uh, and so while I'm gone, uh, I'm very thankful uh, that the elders are giving me this time to be away. Uh, and the two Sundays that I'm going to be gone, uh, Bruce Goodwin is going to be teaching our adult Bible class and uh, preaching our sermon both in person and online. And so I'm so grateful for Bruce uh, being willing to step in and do that while I'm gone. And so uh, I'd just like to ask you that you'd be praying for me in my travels, uh, that everything would go well in my studies, and that I would also like you to pray uh, for Skylar and the kids while I'm gone, because I know uh, I'm so thankful that Skylar is willing to uh, make the really hard sacrifice of not having me around for those two weeks while she cares for both Sage and Judah. And so uh, thank you for your prayers. And if there's something, if there's a need that comes up during that time, uh, you could contact either Ron Delamarta or Doug Nelson, and they'll be glad to help you. Uh, you can send me an email. I just don't know how available I'll be uh, to answer everything while I'm working uh, on my school stuff. But anyway, thank you for your prayers. This morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 through 11. We're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we're going to pick up in this section where Jesus invites us as disciples to pray, to ask God the Father for the things that we need to seek Him and to uh, pursue our relationship with God. But I want to begin in a, a different kind of situation to help set our minds up for this. You know, when I was a student at Freed Hardeman University, my first year, my first semester, I had a uh, work-study job uh, and that job was I worked for the Freed Hardman University Phonathon. And you can imagine what that means is that I, uh, once one or two nights a week, I would go uh, for a few hours and I would make phone calls to alumni and donors asking them for money uh, for the school or for specific uh, programs, things that were going on throughout the year uh, that they needed money for. Now, I, I uh, probably should not have taken this job if I had known myself a little better, I would have probably not done this. Uh, but, but what I realized pretty quickly is that I really don't like asking people for money. I don't like the idea of calling someone and uh, bothering them or, you know, <laughs> interrupting their time. Uh, I don't like the idea of asking somebody for money. It just makes me uncomfortable. I, I don't like that. Um, I also probably, I felt at times fear that uh, the person I was going to talk to was going to be unkind, uh, that they were going to be dismissive, they were going to hang up on me, they were going to be, you know, you can imagine all the thoughts that you would have if you're calling and asking somebody for money. Now, some of you probably really enjoy this, maybe, I don't, I don't know, you can let me know if you do. Uh, some of you are probably really good at this, is that you believe in whatever it is you're asking for money for, uh, you're willing to get out there, and you know that people really do care. Uh, and, you know, that's the truth is that I was calling people, for the most part, that really cared. They were thankful for Freed Hardman. They were thankful for the education they got there or their family member. They were thankful for the experiences they had there, how their faith had been strengthened and encouraged by people there. Uh, so, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted to give, and they were happy to give when they were asked. And so uh, what I found is that this is more of a problem with me. Uh, than it was with the job and what it was requiring, uh, is that I need to believe more, that people are willing to give when asked in humility, with kindness, and if they really believe in whatever it is that you're asking them to give toward, uh, they are more than willing, happy, generous in their care and their willingness to give. So, now why would I start here? It's because there's something about this problem in me, and maybe it's in you too, that I think maybe transfers over into our spiritual lives in relationship with God is that there's something in all of us that is unwilling to ask for help. Uh, there's something in all of us that, that I think makes it hard for us to believe that God not only wants to hear our petitions, our cries for help, but that God also will answer as a loving father. 
And these are two realities about which why we might not want to pray. You know, why is it that sometimes we don't want to pray? We don't want to ask. We don't want to seek God for his help, for his wisdom, for his provision. But one of the reasons is that so often we are tempted as human beings to figure things out for ourselves and to make things happen by our own power. I mean, isn't that what we're taught from a very young age is that you, you got to make things happen. You got to get smart. You got to use your wisdom. You got to uh, work out your plan in order to make something important happen in your life. And so in a very real sense, we're trained to be independent rather than dependent on God and others. Now, obviously, there are going to be abuses of dependence, uh, but God intends for his people, disciples of Jesus, to depend on him for everything, to recognize that every good and perfect gift we've received has come from him, and that without God, we would have nothing, we could do nothing, we would not even be here. And so uh, we need to set aside that temptation to rely on ourselves. Instead, learn to rely on God. Another reason that we might not want to pray or seek God is that we might be tempted to believe that God is distant. God doesn't care. You know, there are a number of people around the world who, who pray to God or to some kind of a spiritual being, and they wonder, and I'm obviously talking about people that are not, for the most part, not disciples of Jesus, and they may wonder, does my prayer even get answered? Does it even, is it even heard? Is there a God out there that listens? And so often our belief about God will affect how we view praying to God. What kind of God is it that we are praying to? And what I believe, what this scripture that we're going to look at today tells us is that when we as followers of Jesus go to God the Father in prayer, we are seeing this God of the Bible who is all-powerful. You know, maybe you've heard that fancy word, omnipotent. But this God who nothing is impossible for, this God. We pray to a God who is omniscient. He knows everything everything that's happening. He knows us from the inside out. He knows everything that we need. This God who is omnipresent, he is everywhere all the time. Uh, he is with us and he knows where we are, what we're doing, what we need. Okay. And that this God, this God not only is all these things, but this God knows and cares for each of us. He knows your name. He loves you. He wants to know your desires, your mind, your heart, your longings. He knows our sin and evil. And this God loves us anyway and invites us to come to him and call on him in prayer and trust him as the good father who loves and cares for us. You know, another reason that you might wonder about prayer is you have these series of questions. Is, does prayer really make a difference? Does God actually listen and respond uh, when we pray? Does it change anything if we pray or if we don't pray? Does he even want to hear my prayer? And, and all these things, all these doubts that you may be carrying, even as a follower of Jesus, Jesus has an answer to our doubts, to our temptations, to our discouragements. And his answer is to invite us to see God as the good and loving father who wants us to ask, seek, knock, because he gives good gifts to those who ask, seek, and knock. You know, I wonder how often our refusal to ask God, to seek God, uh, to pray to him actually might leave God feeling sad, disappointed, uh, because, you know, God who loves us wants us as his children to come to him. You know, why aren't my children talking to me? Why aren't they asking me for help? Why don't they want to be in my presence? You know, I would be really concerned if my children never wanted to talk to me. I love that Sage and Judah want to come and talk to me. When I come home uh, after work, they are excited. They want to see me. They want to speak to me. They want to be present with me. Um, you know, sometimes I, you, you can feel annoyed about this or you can feel thankful is that, you know, my children, I would be concerned if they never asked me for gifts. You know, I would be concerned if Sage never asked me for toys or never asked me for books or never asked me for clothes, never asked me for good gifts from a loving father. Because I know, even though I don't always give them what they want, part of a relationship of being a loving father, my children is giving them the things they need uh, and blessing them. <laughs> Often I get to bless them with things beyond what they need. And I, I would be concerned if my children never wanted to be around me. And I think in all, when you think about all these things, is this is what God, God is inviting us into a relationship where he is our father and we are his children through Jesus, his son. And he invites us to call him Abba, Father, by the Holy Spirit. 
to come into his presence, to ask him for what we need, to receive his love as our father. Uh, and that doesn't mean he always will give us what we want, uh, but that he will give us the good things that we'll ne we need that will help us become like Christ. And so uh, what we want to see as we come to this text is that Israel, the people of God, uh, that Jesus is speaking to on this in this Sermon on the Mount, these disciples that have come around him, they had grown up being taught that God was a father who was worthy of their trust, that God was a father that they should seek in prayer. You know, one of the amazing things about the New Testament is that it reveals to us that one of the favorite books of the Old Testament was the Psalms, is that the Psalms show up in the New Testament. They are quoted more in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book. Now, there are some other books like Isaiah that come close, uh, but the Psalms uh, are above and beyond. <laughs> They're quoted or echoed referenced above all the others. And we see that uh, we believe, many people believe that many of the Jews would have had many of the Psalms, if not all of them, memorized, or at least they were so familiar with praying and singing them uh, as a part of their daily and weekly and monthly, yearly spiritual life, that they were so familiar with them that they had been taught from a young age that they could pray to God, they could pray all the emotions that they felt to God, they could offer their petitions for the things that they need needed from God, whether it was forgiveness of sins or uh, deliverance from enemies or provisions for their day and for their life, for healing from whatever it was that was wrong in their bodies or in their spirits, is that Israelites had learned to pray trusting in God. And in fact, Jesus has already given us, you know, a few weeks ago, we looked at the, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus shows us that God invites us to pray about all the things we need. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus has already given his disciples this prayer that invites them to pray for God's will to be done in their lives and in the world, uh, for God to provide for their daily needs, our daily needs, including food, uh, shelter, clothes, uh, forgiveness of our sins, deliverance from the evil one and from the, the evil things that happen around us, is that we have been invited to pray to God. So here's what we want to remember all the way through, is that God invites us to ask, to seek, to knock in prayer, because he is a good father, who gives good gifts to his children. So let's read the text together in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you this morning, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to know that you are a good father who cares for us and gives us what is good. We pray, Father, that we would seek first your kingdom and that we would pursue your will in our lives every day, that we would want to be more like Christ. We pray, Father, that we would knock, that we would persist in seeking you in prayer, knowing that you will open doors in our lives, that you will give opportunities uh, for us to serve you in this world. Father, um, bless us now as we continue in your word and worship and in prayer together. Father, be with us as we listen. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. When we see what Jesus how Jesus viewed prayer, uh, I think you can hear some of the things that the God had invited the Israelites to do in the Old Testament about how they were to seek him, to knock, to find, uh, to look for him. For example, in Proverbs 8, 17, we hear this language talking about searching for wisdom, wisdom that comes from God. And uh, wisdom in Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Those who love and search for, seek after wisdom will find it. And in a similar way, Jesus uses this kind of language to say those who are asking and seeking and knocking will find God and will find the good gifts that God gives. Jeremiah 29, 13, 14, God said to his people through Jeremiah the prophet while they were in exile, 
you will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will be bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So God had regularly invited his people to ask, to seek him diligently, fervently, prayerfully, and to trust that God would take care of them. You know, when we think about these three words, it, it invites us to reflect, I believe, on what prayer can, can be for us. You know, ask and it will be given, I think points to the reality that when we come to God asking in prayer, that disciples come to God in humility. We come admitting our need for God and his provision. Uh, you know, we come not demanding, but humbly asking, recognizing we deserve nothing, but that God in his grace and his mercy gives us good gifts. Uh, as I was preparing this lesson, uh, it made me think of a character from a movie uh, and a book that many of us probably saw, either saw the movie, different movies, read the book as children. Um, you know, the movie is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right? About this boy who eventually uh, from Willy Wonka inherits this whole chocolate factory and it's this crazy adventure. But along the way, there's a character in the movie, right? You maybe remember the terrible children that are a part of that story. One of those terrible children is the little girl, uh, Veruca Salt, all right? And uh, she's the little girl who's come from a family where basically her parents give her everything she wants. She's been trained and taught that she can demand anything and it will be given to her. And so uh, she's pushy, she's demanding, she's arrogant. And uh, eventually in the movie, you may remember uh, in the movie that she is uh, found to be a bad egg. Uh, in the books, I, I think she's determined to be a bad nut by squirrels and then put down the trash heap. Uh, but, you know, that image of demanding, like this demanding person that says, give me what I want, I deserve it. That is not how we approach God, right? If that image helps you, be the opposite of that, is that we come before God humbly admitting we deserve nothing. Everything we receive is a gift of grace. And only God is the one who can provide us with what we truly need. And what we need above all is, is God and a relationship with him. And that if we have that first and foremost, that is, that is truly what we need. And that God is also a good God who gives us the other things that we need as our father. Okay, knock and it will be open to you. I think this is, or excuse me, I skipped over seek and you will find. Is the disciples are called to seek and pursue the will of God in prayer. So this, I think it, it calls us back to what Jesus said in the last chapter, where he told his disciples in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek God, seek his kingdom, his rule in your life, allow him to guide you, make his kingdom our priority, his righteousness, the purpose of our life. And Jesus at that point was telling his disciples that if we're seeking first the kingdom, uh, that this good God that we serve will take care of our food, our clothes, our shelter. He'll take care of the things that we need, our daily provisions. And then knock and it will be opened. I think this is an invitation. Again, each of these words gives us a progression of ongoing persistence in prayer, in seeking God, confident in God's goodness, that he will open doors and give what is good and best for his people according to his wise and gracious will. And this is what I've been saying all along, is that God will give his people what is good for us. Now, there are some people who take texts like this in the Bible, and, and you maybe have already been thinking about this, right? Is that, well, certainly some people are going to abuse this passage of scripture, basically to say that if they just ask, God will give them whatever they want. If, if they ask God to make them wealthy, God will give it to them. If they ask God for a new car, a new house, or a whatever, God will give it to them. Um, and I think we are... We need to hear that God does not just give us whatever we want. God gives what is good for us. And we, we, I think, are being invited to ask for the right kind of things, to ask for the things that are according to the will of God, not just about our own selfish will being done. Um, James, the brother of Jesus in James 4, 1 through 3, I think, uh, gives some uh, help in understanding what it is that we're to be asking for and the motivations for what we're asking for from God. In James 4, he writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. 
You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so James, as he's writing to these Christians who are clearly uh, at odds with one another and says, you know, you, you're fighting, you're killing, you're coveting, you're stealing, you're doing all these things to get what your selfish desires crave. And you do not have what, what it is you're wanting in some cases because you've never asked God. You've instead gone about it in your own means to try and achieve whatever it is that you desire. And sometimes you, you don't have because you're asking for the wrong thing. You're asking for something that is only about you and your selfishness. It's not at all about seeking God's kingdom. And it's not all at all about loving God and loving your neighbor. And so these kind of texts, they challenge us to reflect on, uh, are we asking God for the good things? That we truly need that will help us become like Christ? And are we asking with the goal of whatever it is God gives, it being offered in service to Jesus and in service to the kingdom? You know, all of us ask for the wrong things at times. We all ask for the wrong reasons. And thankfully, as many a song has said, we are grateful that God does not always give us what we ask for, that God often gives us what we need, that God often gives us something much better than what we would ask for ourselves, we believe in a God who, when we pray, answers our prayers. Now, on the other side of this, N.T. Wright helpfully points out in his uh, New Testament for Everyone book on Matthew, he says, the problem for many of us is not that we are eagerly asking for the wrong things, we are, that we are not eager enough to ask for the right things. So it's not that people are running around asking God for all these terrible things, but some of us are not we don't even believe this text as deeply as Jesus wants us to believe. Some of us don't even try. We don't even ask God fervently, prayerfully for the good things that he wants to give us. We don't even ask God as much for the Holy Spirit. We don't ask God for his daily provisions. We don't ask God for opportunities to serve him faithfully in the kingdom. And so some of us might just be encouraged uh, to ask ourselves, why is that? Why is it that I'm not fervently seeking God in prayer? Why is it that I'm not asking and seeking and knocking? What is it about me or about my belief in God that's keeping me from actually believing what Jesus says and following his invitation to pray to God? Now, Jesus will teach his disciples to go to God, to ask him for what they need, and to expect that God will respond and God will give good gifts. Now, the disciples and us, I believe Jesus teaches this because we need to hear it just like they did, is that we can wonder, will God answer our prayers? Does God care? And we've already said that this is not a promise that God will give us everything that we ask for. But Jesus also knows that sometimes we will pray and we will not get what we want. In fact, there are instances in the Gospels where the disciples prayed for something and their prayers were not answered. They didn't receive what they wanted. Instead, God gave them something different. Now, even in that reality, we can believe that God will be with us, that God does love us, and we can trust God to hear us and answer according to his will. And this is the second part of why, why Jesus would invite us to ask and seek and pray is that he grounds it in the foundational belief that God is a good father. God is a good father who gives good gifts to his children. This is what Jesus points out in the second half of this text is uh, he points out the reality of who we are as human parents. He says, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent, right? He points out this, this reality that for most of us, not every parent is a good parent. Not every father or mother loves their children or gives them what they actually ask for or what they need. But for the most part, we see parents all around us who love their children and who give their children the things that they need. If your child asks you for a snack or asks you for food, um, I don't know of any, any parents around me, uh, any of you that are part of our church family here, who would give your kid a rock, right? <laughs> you would give your kid the food that they need. Uh, you know, if they ask for a fish, you're not going to give him a snake. Uh, you're not going to give him a serpent. Um, you're going to give your child what, what you need. You're going to be a, a good parent to them. And so Jesus points out this reality about uh, most, the majority of human parents is that they give their children what they need. Um, and then he makes this, I think, pretty startling and challenging statement for all of us. If you then, who are evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus uh, points out to us the reality that even every single one of us, the, even the best father and mother, the best parent is every single one of us as human beings. We are not inherently good as we think of ourselves, but that every one of us are sinners. Every one of us have evil that dwells within us, that we do not always desire God's will being done in our lives. We don't always do the right thing. And Jesus takes this argument and says, well, if you, if you people who are evil, who are sinners, care for your children in this way, how much more will this good and perfect, sinless, just, holy, righteous, loving God, how much more will this God give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, he is so much greater than we are, and he will give what we need. And this is, is the truth, is that because God is better than us, he will give us good gifts. God is completely good, and this is what the scripture celebrates. So, for example, Psalm 37, 3 and 4 says this about God. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 84, 11 says this, where the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk brightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And then James 1, verses 16 and 17 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no vari variation or shadow due to change. God is good a good father who gives good things to his children. You may have read the Gospel Luke's version of this story, and I find it interesting and helpful sometimes to notice the differences. And in Luke's story, uh, uh, Luke's version in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, he says that God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him for it, that God will offer his presence, his power, his uh, quipping, his comfort through the spirits dwelling in us. And obviously, Matthew is, is, would include the Holy Spirit in that, but, but it's all the good things that we need. And so God good, God's good gifts for his people would include the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of our sins, provisions for our needs. Because God is good. God is the one who creates, who orders, who sustains, who listens, who disciplines his children, who protects us, who guides us, who reconciles us, who does over and over again all these good things that we need in order to experience life. And this is what we are being invited to believe first, is that we have a good God who is a father to his children, a good God who answers our prayers. And because of that, we should ask, we should seek, we should knock. We should go to God in prayer. You know, your goodness as a mother or a father, you may be thinking about this, is that we learn how to be good mothers and fathers from God who is our father. You might not have had a good earthly mother or father, and yet you can learn how to be a good father, to be a good mother, to be a good parent from the example of God and his goodness and how he cares for us, how he at times disciplines us, how, how often he gives us what we need rather than what we want. Um, because God is good to us, we can learn how to be good to our children, how to be good to others. And our prayer, your prayer is that as we care for our children, as we care for other people, is that they would come to know the God who is a good and loving father through us, through the way we treat others, the way we love them. You know, Scott McKnight in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he says that there are reasons that we might be discouraged from praying. And maybe you've felt this. And I, I just think it's worthwhile sharing what he said there and, and giving us this, this help in terms of uh, encouragement to continue even when we feel discouraged. One is sometimes we are discouraged from believing this about God and praying because we have unanswered, deeply felt petitions. So, you know, sometimes you ask God for something and it doesn't matter that much, right? Whether or not this turns out the way you want it, it's not, not a big deal at the end of the day. But sometimes we ask God for things that we desire deeply, right? Maybe you've been praying for years for the conversion of a friend or a family member, right? You've been praying and praying and trying to just model for them Christ-likeness, trying to share them the word of God when you have opportunity the gospel. Um, and yet, year after year after year, it seems like this person this, that you love has never actually become a disciple of Jesus. Maybe you've prayed for healing from your own diseases or for the diseases of a beloved family member or friend. And um, no matter how long or hard you've prayed, that person ended up dying and not getting better. 
Maybe you've prayed for a job for a really long time and you've not actually received that job that you wanted or you've continued in employment that you really don't like. Maybe you've prayed for injustices to be righted. We see a world that is so flawed, so messed up by the power of sin and death where so many lives are destroyed and thrown away or just really ruined by sin and evil. And we long and pray for the world to be better. And we could pray deeply, fervently about these things and not see them turn out the way we hoped for. And when we don't get the answer we desire, we can become discouraged about our prayer. And yet Jesus would invite us to continue to pray. That even if we haven't received what we want, when we want it, how we wanted it, that we could keep praying because God is good. Even when we don't get what we desire, God is still good and God gives an answer. God gives good things to his children. Another reason that you might be discouraged from praying is, well, if God knows what I need, why, why bother praying? You know, there are some gifts that you've received as surprises, right? Um, maybe you like being surprised. Maybe you like surprise gifts. Um, but often, many times, gifts come as a result of asking. I'm, I'm not much of a surprise gift kind of person. So if you do that, I, I'll smile. I'll say thank you. It's just not, not the way I am. I would much rather, I'm one of those sick people that would much rather know what I'm getting and be able to ask for the thing that I need or want. And uh, amazing how often if we ask, we might actually receive the thing that we want or need. And so we know that when we love other people or we live in relationship with another person, we, we ask, right? We ask for the thing we want or need. And I think this is part of why God invites us as his disciples to ask is that God knows what we need, but he wants to live in a genuine relationship of loving care with us, is that God really does want to hear us pray because he loves us and he wants us to come to him in love and in trust, and that he wants to hear our request and respond in grace and mercy and give us good gifts. And here's the question that all of us might ask, is how much do we not have because we do not ask and we do not ask because we do not believe that God is good. So today, Jesus is inviting you to believe God is good. And he's inviting you to ask, to seek, and to knock. One way that you might begin to do this is to, to think about what is the rhythm of prayer that I have in my life? One, one way that I would invite you to begin to ask and seek and knock is to set a regular rhythm of prayer in your daily life. Let me invite you to try praying in the morning, either at a set time in the morning or when you get up in the morning. Let me invite you to pray at midday, at noon, or when you stop for lunch. Let me invite you to pray in the evening at a set time or before you go to bed. And at each of those times, pray and allow God to remind you of his love. Bring before God your, your petitions, your prayers, your longings, the things that you desire and to see done in your life and in the lives of others and then maybe even write out the specific prayer request that you're asking for it's it's easy to um to be really vague right have you prayed and been really vague about what you're asking god for and if we're so vague you know as and sometimes we need to be vague because we don't know exactly what it is that we're we're asking god to do or what we're asking for we don't know exactly what what would be the best thing but there are other times where it would be really helpful if we actually got specific about the things we're praying about so that we would actually know uh, whether God answered and how God answered. If God said no, if God said yes, if God said, you know, as you've probably heard it, wait, uh, or God says later. Um, if we could get specific, we might actually begin to realize when God is hearing our prayers and answering them. And we might actually be led to not only ask, but also to give thanks when we receive to be a people of gratitude. So let me invite you to, if you need this, you might need this to help, is to set an alarm in the morning, at midday, and then the evening, and allow those three times of prayer to draw you into the relationship of a good father loving his children, right? Is in the morning when we begin our day with a reminder of God's love and prayer, it can change the trajectory of our day from the very beginning. When we stop in the middle of the day and maybe everything's falling apart at work or at home and we take a pause for a moment and just pray and ask God for help and we remember his goodness, it can reset our work and reset our hope in the gospel and remind us that we are not 
doing this on our own, but we're dependent on God. And when we come to the end of a day and we are wearied, we are tired, we are maybe encouraged or discouraged by what we accomplished during the day, uh, we are wondering if, you know, can I really sleep at peace? To come to God again in prayer at night is a reminder that God is the one who holds the world in his hands. You and I are not responsible for how everything is going to turn out, but that he in his grace and mercy loves us and he will take care of us even while we sleep. Let me invite you to do that. Jesus, the son, models for us a life of asking and praying, seeking and knocking. He often goes to God the Father in prayer. He trusts his Father to give him what is good. Jesus knew that there would be times where he would be praying and he would not receive what he asked for from God. In fact, you know, we are given an, a clear example of where Jesus asked for one thing, but the thought, and he said, but not my will, but your will be done. When Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 39, we're, we're told, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And we know that God, the Father's answer to the, cru the cup of the cross being removed from Jesus was no. That God told Jesus no. And he told Jesus that you will have to be crucified. And Jesus submitted himself to the Father's will. And Jesus receives from God the Father what is best, what is good, that it was good for Jesus the Son to suffer so that sin and death would be defeated for all of us. It was good for all of us that Jesus said yes to his Father's answer, that Jesus submitted himself to the Father's will. And not only that, but God raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus received the gift of having authority in heaven and on earth over all things, that he would reign as king forever. This was better for us, and this was better for Jesus. We have now, now have salvation because Jesus lived and died according to the Father's will. When you and I come to the Father, when we come to the table, we are here asking, seeking, knocking, saying, God, help us be more like what we see in Jesus. Help us to be people shaped by the cross who are willing to offer up our lives in service to your kingdom, no matter what the cost, and help us to live in hope of the resurrection, knowing that no matter what it is, no matter what happens in life and in death, we will one day be raised with Christ and dwell with you forever. Let's take the cup and the bread together this morning. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the body of Jesus given on the cross for our sins. Bless us now as we take the bread and eat it together. Lord, we come asking for your help. We come seeking you and your presence. We come knocking at the door, hoping that you would make us more like Jesus and that you would use us for your purposes in the world. Father, please help us to remember Christ now and what he's done as we take the bread together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's pray for the cup. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who gave his precious blood on the cross for our sins. Father, thank you that he was willing to die so that we might be healed, we might be forgiven, we might be given the good gift of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us. Father, we pray and thank you that you have given us the good gift of knowing who you are through Jesus, your son, and by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, bless us now as we drink the cup. Help us to go out and live for you in the world to be living examples of the kind of love that you are and the love that you've shown us as our Father. Be with us, Lord, now as we take the cup. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you again for joining me today in this time of uh, sermon, prayers, taking communion. We love you. We are grateful for your life of faith. We pray for you that you are serving the Lord and seeking his kingdom day by day as you try to do your work, care for your family, love your neighbors. Uh, let me just invite you that if you have prayer requests, please uh, send us a message uh, to the Richfield Church of Christ. You can find our email on our website. Uh, you can send us a message through Facebook. You can leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, we have a Facebook page where you can send us a private message. Uh, there are many ways that you can get in touch with us, and we would love to pray with you. We would love to help you become a disciple of Jesus by putting on Christ in repentance and baptism, 
and living a new life through his death and resurrection. Thanks for being with me. I thank you for your prayers. God bless you.